It's my privilege and honor and also a sad duty to extend to you a most sincere welcome to this very special service today. A celebration service, it is, for Desmond Hills. A loving and loved husband, father, grandfather, pastor, evangelist, leader of youth, author, administrator, one skillful in organization, a loyal and a good friend, a lover of the Bible, and above all else, a lover of Jesus, who was the controlling power in Des's life. One of God's men has suddenly been taken from us, and the number of people that I see in the church today testify to the way his influence has been experienced by all of us. We've also come here today to express our sympathy and support for the members of Des's family, who appreciate so much your being here. To his daughter, Nerily, and her two children, Luna and Declan, and to his son, Alan, his wife, Marion, their two daughters, Kylie and Jenna, and Jenna's three children, including twins, I understand just two weeks old, is it? Have I got it right? Three weeks, good. I know that Des's wife, Val, also greatly appreciates your presence and support today. Those who will miss Des in her family in, uh, will certainly uh, are here in force today and we appreciate their presence. There's Wayne and his wife, Haley, Darren, his wife, Tracy, and Raylene and Belinda, and Val's grandchildren and great-grandchildren as well. Two more family members that I notice are here today that I would especially welcome are Peter Weeks and his wife Gillian. Gillian is the sister of Des's first wife, Ruth, who passed away in 2014. We come together today to not only to mourn the loss of this man of God, but to celebrate a wonderful life dedicated to the service of his Lord. I have been impressed, and I've known Des for more than 65 years. When I look back over the life that he's lived, his tireless energy I've admired so much, the exacting thoroughness with which he applied himself to any task that he had to do, the enthusiasm that he always showed in the work that he did, the exacting thoroughness with which he applied himself to every task, I'm sure these qualities and many others will be remembered by those of us who have known Des well. It's unfortunate that we cannot sing together because there'd be much to praise the Lord for, but we can all pray together. And I would invite Pastor Roger Nixon, who has been invited to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Roger. As you know, Pastor Desmond Hills was born in uh, Rangiora, a little town then, close to the city of Christchurch in South New Zealand, Aotearoa. And in the Kiwi context, the Maoris would say, a giant kauri has fallen. Let us pray together bow our heads. Our gracious Father in heaven, we gather together this morning as next of kin, family and friends to pay homage to one of your faithful servants, Desmond Basil Hills, evangelist, outstanding leader in Pathfinder and Youth Ministries, Bible-focused author, able administrator, and mentor to many people, not just here in Australia, but in many nations around our earth. And yes, our Father, a man of spiritual influence for good in a difficult world. 
But above all, a loving husband, father, stepfather, grandfather, great-grandfather, and a caring, genuine friend to so many. We thank you, our Father, for the precious golden memories. And this morning we pray for your blessing and your presence during this time of farewell and celebration. In particular, we pray for Val, loving wife, and children, Nearly, Ellen, and all members of the Hills Ferris families. Heavenly Father, you have promised to wipe away all tears from our eyes. We invite you to fill that promise. You have promised to give peace, a peace which the world cannot give. We ask you to fulfill that promise also. You have promised to be with us always. Thank you for that assurance. As our sympathy goes out to the families of Des, we know, we acknowledge that sympathy alone cannot bind up the broken heart. Only you can do that. We invite you to perform that gracious and that healing ministry. Des so frequently signed off with the Bible word Maranatha, an appeal for the second coming. And as we celebrate Des' life journey, this morning, may our minds and hearts be focused on that great second of Advent. What a day of change and transformation that will be. What a day. No more getting older. No more hospitals, nursing homes or funeral services. No more wars, COVID-19, ravaging floods, bushfires, no more poverty, no more man's inhumanity to man. And so, Heavenly Father, we look forward to that time. Oh yes, what a change. Eternal bodies and a great day of reunion. Reunion with loved ones and friends who've gone before. Maranatha, and we pray in the name of Jesus, the conqueror of death, the resurrection and the life. Amen. A life of faith, hope, and love. This is the life sketch of Desmond Basil Hills, who was born on the 11th of January, 1932, in Rangiora, South New Zealand, and died at Wyong, New South Wales, on Tuesday, 6th of October, 2020. Desmond was the youngest child of Charles and Edith Hills. His sister Beryl was 11 years older, but died when Desmond was eight years old. Desmond also had an older brother, Ron, 10 years his senior, who left home when Des was still young. Desmond's father, Charles, was not an easy man to live with, but young Des was the apple of his mother's eye. Edith Hills instilled within Desmond a belief in self and a love for other people. When Desmond reached school age, the family moved from the farm to Christchurch where Des grew up. At the age of 12, his mother took him to an evangelistic campaign run by pastors Ball and Harvey. 
Joseph and his mother were baptized at this time and became Seventh-day Adventists. During this time, Desmond became lifelong friends with the late Don Moody and Rob Dixon. That's not worded terribly well because Rob Dixon is still with us and well. Is he here today? There he is. I wouldn't want a false story to start, Rob. As teenagers, the three of them packed their camping gear onto bicycles and pedaled their way around the South Island of New Zealand. Desmond was enrolled in the prestigious Christchurch Boys High School and did well. He even sang in the school choir. Unfortunately, it was a very, or fortunately, it was a very large choir which disguised the fact that Des, despite his many talents, could not sing a note in tune. At the same time, he became active within the local church, particularly with the JMVs, Junior Missionary Volunteers, and the MVs, Missionary Volunteers. And I'm sure those words bring back many memories to the ancient ones among us. This was prescient to the fact that he was to become a world leader of Adventist youth. By this time, Desmond had determined to become a minister. And following school, he moved north to attend Longburn College near Palmerston North in the North Island, graduating in 1950 from the pre-ministerial course. In 1951, Desmond sailed on the MV Wanganella to Sydney to enrol at Avondale College in Kurumbong, New South Wales. Known to be a serious-minded young man with a purpose, he commenced his studies at Avondale. On his first day at college, he met a stunning young lady by the name of Ruth Baxter as they waited in the textbook line, as you do. Even though any romance at Avondale was a strictly non-contact sport, a relationship was established with Ruth, and despite these distractions, Desmond was a good student and became vice president of the Ministerial League and eventually even passed Greek, which was a known giant killer among ministerial students and graduated as president of his class in 1954, but not before he had hitched the horses and worked his garbage shift at the college to earn money for the ring. Following his graduation from Avondale, Des and Ruth moved back to New Zealand, where Des was appointed as preceptor and Bible teacher at Longburn College, a position he held until, until 1958, when he was appointed to the North New Zealand Conference Evangelism Team. At Longburn, Alan Charles Hill joined the family, weighing in at a massive 11 pounds, seven ounce the largest baby Palmerston North Hospital had ever seen to date. Alan, I doubt if you were the one who inserted that into this life sketch. By 1960, the little family boarded the boat back to Australia and Desmond returned to Avondale College, this time as preceptor and Bible teacher. The family continued to grow and narrowly Ruth Hills was born in October 1960. This was a busy time for Des due to his increasing involvement with Pathfinders, as well as studying for his bachelor's degree in theology from which he graduated in 1962. In 1964, Desmond was appointed to the North New South Wales Conference as the Youth and Communication Director, a position he held until 1967. A feature of this period was the first division-wide Australasian Division Youth Congress held in 1964 at the Maya Music Bowl in Melbourne. Can I see the hands of anybody who might have attended that? There's a few. I didn't spot you, though. In 1967, Desmond was called to the Trans-Tasman Union Conference as Youth and Public Relations Director at the comparatively young age of 35, this involved frequent travel across the Tasman to New Zealand, but now it was by plane rather than boat. Des became more and more in demand as a public speaker at various campgrounds, Bible camps and congresses within the Australasian division. 
This was not to last forever because his abilities became known further afield and he was called to be the Youth and Communications Director for the Trans-African Division in 1970. The family was to stay in Africa until 1975. Africa was in a state of political turmoil during this period and Desmond's work was challenging and sometimes extremely dangerous. He was often separated from his family for up to eight weeks, during which time the family had no contact with him. It was only on his return they would learn of guerrilla ambushes in the middle of the closed-in forests, possibly guerrillas as well, and uh, snakes in bed or his face swelling up until he couldn't see, 15 hours from help. He was cut off from civilization and was known to sleep on the ground and eat sudsa. Now, I googled sudsa this morning narrowly. All I got was that it was a type of soap. Um, it, a maize meal. You made that very clear. <laughs> cooked in rusty 44-gallon drums when traveling in remote areas for youth rallies. Here, without microphones, he would preach to audiences of 5,000 plus on hillsides with just the power of his mighty voice, God, and an interpreter. He brought thousands of young people to God through bringing the Pathfinder movement to Southern Africa and making it as accessible to the poorest areas. He rewrote all the manuals specifically for Africa and printed inexpensive copies. He set up a cheap production line, consisting of his kids, in his home to silkscreen and sew thousands of banners, flags and, and neckerchiefs so clubs could be started from the Zaire down to Cape Town. Alan and Nerily attended boarding school in Rhodesia while well, he was away, I missed him very much, but he always made sure he had work trips planned during school holiday times so the whole family could go with him. Des's influence on the youth of Africa can be summed up by a statement made in an email to Nerily last week from Zimbabwe. Be assured, Nerily, he will have many African jewels in his crown. His continuing involvement with Pathfinders brought him into contact with the World Pathfinder leader, Leo Ranzolan, and it is not surprising that he was called to be the general, to the General Conference in Washington, D.C. as Associate Youth Director in 1975, the position he held until 1981. This involved a huge amount of travel, about six to seven months a year, during these travels, Des visited more than 80 countries, preaching or teaching in around 50 of them. You just want to let that soak in. Des Hills never forgot his roots and finally returned to New Zealand where he became president of the North New Zealand Conference in 1981. He remained in this position until 1986 when he was called to be president of the Trans-Australian Union Conference in Melbourne. While Des always had a heart for youth, he always said he didn't want to stay in youth work when he was no longer relevant. His work as an administrator was marked by a heart of leadership, kindness and compassion for others. He was known for always looking for the best in people and his unfailing belief that Christianity is about what you do and not what you say. Now, just a slight correction here. 1998, we believe, we had a little consultation this morning, marked his official retirement because he only took on the appointment at the TAUC in 1986. But Des did not slow up at all as he and Ruth served as volunteers in country New South Wales, West Australia and South Australia, caring for churches. They also supported John Carter on a number of occasions by caring for the Big Carter Report Church in Los Angeles for a month at a time, while John Carter was overseas running major campaigns. Through all of this, Desmond nurtured another passion by promoting the Science of the Times magazine throughout Australia and New Zealand, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars in sponsorship and new subscriptions, allowing the wider spread of the magazine's reach.
And I can see a nod coming from Mr. Dunstan. In 2012, Ruth was diagnosed with cancer and was taken into high care 12 months later. She fought a brave battle, but passed away in August 2014, and Des will sleep at her side in the Avondale Cemetery. In 2016, Desmond married the beautiful Velma Ferris Hills. At the Toronto Adventist Church, this marriage was a second romance for both of them. Des would often say this is a love that is on top of and not instead of. And the family has delighted in their partnership. Shortly thereafter, Des and Velma were thrilled by the arrival of his first great-grandchild, Willow, and just three weeks ago, identical twin girls, Tallulah and Poppy. Des adored his grandchildren, Kylie, Jenna, Luna, and Declan, as well as his many adopted nieces and nephews, kids and grandkids. They literally were his world. He prayed often for each and every one of them by name. In his last conversation, a phone call to Alan, he prayed for Willow and the twins, Jenna and Carly, Alan and Marion, as he was leaving for the hospital. He told narrowly to tell Luna and Declan that he loved them. His greatest desire was for each to feel the love of Jesus that he had shared with so many around the world. Desmond Hills was a combination of high intelligence maximum charisma and boundless energy. He authored four books, dozens of manuals and booklets, hundreds of articles over the course of his life. Let that sink in as well. His devotional book, Light for My Life, was republished twice, translated into three other languages. It is still in print with a circulation in the excess of 70,000. His latest book, Back to Bible Basics, Forward in Faith, Hope and Love, is the book he says he wished he had written when he was learning to be a, a Christian. Des declined rapidly during 2020 and passed to his rest on 6th of October 2020, surrounded by his extended family. He never deviated from his high calling to God and now sleeps in the blessed hope. I'm not sure if it is uh, because Des and my father Rob and uh, Don Moody were such good friends as young fellas. Uh, I'm not sure if it's because of that, that whenever I um, contacted Des or ran uh, into him, he always treated me more as a friend than um, a youth leader. And we would often banter together. Uh, and it was no surprise that uh, I had been invited to sing at a Longburn College reunion, and there he was, in the front row with a grin on his face, and I thought, we're in for some heckling tonight. <laughs> and um, sure enough, after a few songs, he called out from the front row and said, um, play something faster. <laughs> and uh, I said, look, I, I don't want to do anything that might encourage you to sing along, Des. <laughs> and he said, don't you worry, I won't sing, but I'll clap along and tap my feet. So I started playing a lively version of Will the Circle and um, he called out once again, <laughs> um, I can't hear you. And someone from the audience heckled back to him and said, turn your hearing aid up. <laughs> <laughs> and so it went on for a while, this wonderful uh, banter backwards and forwards. And uh, I always treasured the notion that he was a man that was full of energy and charisma and a wonderful, powerful leader, but he had no airs and graces and was down to earth. And uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure to know him. So uh, this song came to me when a, a friend, some friends of mine lost their little baby. And I 
thought it was might be appropriate for today. I came to know Desmond Hills as a colleague, a fellow president and fellow union president. I came to know his true blue dedication to his Lord as we so often met in meetings and also travelling around the world at times. Des would lighten the times together with his absolute faith in the leading of the Lord both in our own personal lives and in the working of the church on earth. 
being together with Des was always a pleasant time as we shared uh, the purpose and direction of life that wanted the coming of the Lord to be hastened. The passing of Des brings again the overwhelming desire to pray for and to look for the coming of our Lord in the clouds of glory. May we all again live as we plan to be together soon in glory. I was asked by Pastor John Carter if I would read his tribute to Desmond Hills. He said, I first met Desmond Hills in 1961. It was my last year at Avondale and his first year as preceptor, as the Dean of Men was called in those distant days. He brought to his leadership role a special brand of enthusiasm combined with a sunny devotion to Christ. He powerfully influenced my life and that holy influence remains. He made simple Christianity infectious. When he's preached, his sincerity, uh, his sincerity or passion for the mission of the gospel brought that alive. He had the unique gift of affirmation and many of us believed in the attainment of impossible goals because he inspired belief in the God of impossible dreams. Our paths crossed down through the years. He invited me to his camp meeting when he was president in North New Zealand and later on came to minister in my church when we were in Los Angeles. People felt better because of his presence. He had the capacity to light up a room and people loved him. I've seen people in LA battered and bruised by the conflict of survival in a city that more resembled a gladiatorial contest than a peaceful habitation and found in him a caring friend who genuinely cared for their happiness. He was good to be around and even if he never preached a sermon, he somehow made you feel better and that good things were coming your way. He inspired hope and did so in a way that was totally transparent and loving. Pastor Hills was a genuine Christian. He made people forget the hypocrisy of fake religion. He was, in the words of a know-it-all, seen-it-all LA TV producer, the real deal. My life today seems a little less complete because Des Hills is gone. He can't be replaced. There was no one quite like him. But Pastor Hills is not really gone, is he? He's just taking a little nap. He'll be back. Same smile, same enthusiasm, same can-do attitude, same love of family, same belief in the God of the impossible, but so much more. His best days are still to come. Of this saint of God, this prince among men, we say, rest in peace, arise in glory. The General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the South Pacific Division would like to pay tribute to Pastor Des Hills. We are actually uh, in annual council at the moment, it means a very late night and early morning Zoom meetings. And uh, Des's passing was noted by our General Conference President, uh, and uh, he uh, had people pray for the, the Hills family um, and those who are mourning twice 
during our, our, our council. I never got to work closely with Pastor Des Hills, but I have known about him all of my life. My grandfather, Austin, and my dad, Calvin, knew Des from his boyhood in Christchurch. And um, what I have, have seen and observed, that he, he was always respected, fair, loyal, had good perspective, progressive, a good writer, and preacher, was wanting to influence everybody, particularly to, to Jesus. There are three things that I particularly note. Uh, the first was as a teenager, our family read the Light for My Life uh, devotional um, in our family worship, and I can still remember some of the stories that um, came from Africa that uh, Pastor Des Hills had um, experienced and, and wrote about. The second was when I was a young pastor, uh, he was union president of the Trans-Australian Union. I didn't know that he really knew me, but as Pastor Harker has just said, um, I guess because of family connection, he made a beeline to me and knew me by name, knew what I was doing and uh, encouraged me and I kind of felt walking tall because of that. And uh, lastly, when I was president of the Western Australian Conference, we invited um, Pastor Hills to, to come and to work on the, the signs, which was his passion at that time. Now, he had been the union president of that area. He had spoken well. Um, his preaching was well appreciated. And um, he came to the camp meeting. Uh, lots of people knew him. And um, I, I just remember that he didn't, like some people, try and push himself to, to get the limelight and to get up at the front of the, the stage and, and, and do various things. He was willing to sit in his booth, greet the people and promote signs. And I don't think we've ever had such a good promoter, certainly within uh, my, my lifetime. And uh, I, I really valued that humble um, enthusiasm. And so the Seventh-day Adventist Church will certainly miss this fine Christian leader. the living dead 
voices who cry out for living prayer. Arise, almighty army, take up thy shield and sword, for the Father lives his golden lamp beside. Dead. And he'd jump out of the shadows saying, I'm the man with the whiskers and the rubber neck. And I'd scream, no, he'd say, who's the man with the whiskers and the rubber neck? And I'd jump and I'd say, I am. And then I'd run after him and jump on him and wrestle him. And we'd laugh. He was larger than life and full of fun and possibilities. My brother and I had a magical life growing up, a life of adventure, of new places and people, of new animals and experiences. My parents instilled in us confidence in both of us to face these challenges. And while we did it in very different ways, because we are very different personalities, both of us, both of those ways were, re were respected and acknowledged for what they were, and both of us had our potentials fostered by our parents. As you heard, Dad travelled an awful lot, and I really missed him. Alan was much closer to Mum when we were growing up, and I'm not saying that Alan didn't miss Dad when he was travelling, he did, but Dad was my soulmate. Um, I spent hours talking to, venting to, unpacking ideas with Dad. He was always there. When he was in administration in North New Zealand and the TTUC, he often had um, Friday afternoons that he worked at home. 
he did housework and did pre present, um, preparation for sermons and presentations, and he also spent an hour on the phone with me. Um, those hours, once a week for about 20 years, were my lifeline. No subject off limits, no problem too curly. We did politics, we did social events, we did his work problems, my work problems, my friend problems, his friend problems. Not that he really had that many problems. Um, our Friday conversations took place in the cone of silence. Our lips were sealed. As kids, we couldn't complain about the amount that Dad was gone because we were so, so proud of him. And he was also the about the most involved father on the planet. When he was home, he was really home. Um, he planned as many of his youth camps and camperies and rallies at times that he could take us with him. He wrote copious letters, he planned amazing adventures, and he, and he worked with us on developing very eclectic life skills. My ability to sew comes from stitching thousands of Pathfinder neckerchiefs and flags. My brother knows how to print and to silk screen because of those flags and neckerchiefs and all of the cards and brochures and manuals. And we knew we, this was the only way that pathfindering was going to take place through Africa is if our family did it ourselves. And we did. One summer, he planned it so that he did an inspection um, preaching tour of all the US, well, not all of them, of the summer camps in the caravan so that we could go with him. We traveled through more than 35 US states in that trip, visiting 15 youth camps, a bunch of colleges and universities. He preached and, and um, taught in all of those places. We took two weeks holidays in the middle of it, went to Disneyland and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, we traveled 11,000 miles on that trip and saw more of America than most Americans will ever see. Um, my dad not only had very big shoes, he had very big hands. His hands that reached across the cultural, economic, social and religious divides. This is a man that never discriminated. He believed in equal pay for equal work. He championed women's rights right from the very beginning. He believed in the equality of the races. He disagreed with Western enculturation of religion in third world countries. He vigorously supported religious liberty and the separation of church and state and he was not afraid to say so. He also had big hands that he loved to get dirty. He was a man who was never happier when, than when he had his elbows, it was up to his elbow in dirt. Um, all of his grandkids have been willing helpers um, in the garden, riding wheelbarrows, building things, fixing things, maintaining watering systems and landscaping in the garden. Dad used to hate it if mum washed his work clothes because he says, they're only going to get dirty again. We called him a hobo because he was unrecognisable when he was in his happy clothes. There wasn't much that he couldn't fix. Coming home from Africa one time, the fur -fur furlough the very first time, um, we got to fly. Um, we'd been there for three years in Africa. We'd had three phone calls home in that time. This is a generation where you didn't get emails and stuff. The Drapers used to send us, or the Weekses and the Drapers and other people used to send us um, cassette tapes. And the Drapers particularly, they we used to put the ABC, um, they'd record the beginning of the ABC news. Dum, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. And that's how our tapes would start each time. Of course, it was very, very, very old by the time it got to us, but it was very memorable. Anyway, we, we were able to fly home on our first furlough, but to fly home, we had to, um, had to fly via Malawi to Kenya, to Italy, to India, to Taiwan, to New Zealand, to Sydney, then back via Singapore to Japan, to Italy, etc., 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 to get home, which is a real shame. Um, but being very poor missionaries, um, Dad had found a camper van in Rome that, he ha that had to be returned to London. Um, and all he had to do was to dry clean the sleeping bags and return the van clean and in good condition. So we took a free trip through Europe, 
in the dead of winter, we parked on the side of the road each night, um, so it didn't cost anything. And just before London, though, he backed into a rock on the side of the road and he cracked the fiberglass. Now, this was very troublesome because that was money and we didn't have any. Uh, not to worry, down to the hardware store and he picked some fiberglass cut putty and a gas torch, not thinking about the petrol tank that was right next to the crack. Um, thank you, guardian angels. However, we also had lived in Australia and Africa all our lives and didn't understand winter in Europe. Um, and his nose had been running while he was trying to fix this and the drips had frozen and he went inside when he came inside, his hands were frozen, his nose was frozen, he wiped his nose and took the tip of his nose off. However, he didn't have to pay for the camper van. <laughs> Dad also had the biggest heart. He preached often about God's unconditional love for the world. But what will stay with each of us who flew in his orbit is our assurance of his unconditional love for us. Not once in my life did I ever doubt my parents' love for me. I always knew that they loved me, that they were proud of me. Sometimes not so proud of what I did, but they were proud of me. But Dad's heart was far bigger than that. My gorgeous Debbie, who Dad adopted as his own when she was around 19, about, what, 42 years ago? Oh, sorry. Um, said to me the other day, Dad had an infin infinite capacity for love, I think were your words, um, that there was never any thought that his love for her and her kids would ever cause a problem with me and my kids because he always had more than enough unconditional love for absolutely everyone. This became really apparent five years ago when he met and fell in love with Valme, loving her so, so much as he did, Val but then never once wavering in his memory or his love for my mum. And that was just so beautiful. When Dad started having grandchildren, I might just take a breath. You would have thought his loving heart was going to explode. Kylie in New Zealand, Jenna, Luna, Declan, you were his world. Granddad spent his life sharing God's love with young people around the world. And then you came into his life. He prayed for each one of you every single day by name, on his knees, by his bed, until he couldn't kneel anymore. You can live your lives knowing just how much you were cherished and how much he wants to see you again. This love for people was at the very core of Dad's ministry. We've heard this from all the tributes and of his everyday life. He always put people above policy. He was determined to make sure that you were okay in here. He thought about family implications and about the two sides of every story, about the fact that we are all flawed people and that about how Jesus always gave people the benefit of redemption. Dad always reached out to people who were hurting, people who were being abused, people who had been misrepresented. He fought for injustice and prejudice where he saw it and he brought up his family to do the same. His motto was, what would Jesus do? My dad had very large shoes that left very large footprints. We cannot possibly fill his shoes, but we can follow in his footsteps. Maranatha. Psalms 1, 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, 
and in his, in his law he meditates day and night. He shall, be, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. Thank you, Declan, for sharing Psalms 1 with us this morning. Just invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, it has been a morning of of memories, of sharing the life of DBH. And this morning we give thanks for this life that, that you led and that he lived and lived it so well according to your calling. And so, Father, as we turn now to a book that he loves so dearly, may we find words of encouragement, words of hope that will take us through the, the hours, the days and the weeks ahead to look at, us, look at the faith and the hope and be reminded of, of who Des was. And so, Lord, guide us as we, we reflect this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends and family, it's, it's been a privilege this morning to listen to the stories of, of Des. As a father, as a husband, as grandchildren, as friends. And I guess as we look, not just for those of us that are here, but for those that are watching online, we could take days to recount the memories of of Des and the impact that he's had on, on each of our lives in just so many different ways. In the last couple of days, I have been glancing through um, Pastor Des's Bible and I have to say what an incredible privilege it is to peer inside and walk with someone through their spiritual walk. And this morning as we open scripture together, the texts that have been chosen were those that were, were special to Des. They're the ones that he underlined, the ones that he made comments on, the ones that I guess as, as we would look through and maybe successive generations look through his word, through scripture, you will see what was precious to him. And so this morning, I, I just want to draw attention to, to some of these that were meaningful to him and, and meaningful to me over the last couple of days as, as I've reflected on, this, on his Bible. When Narrowly posted last Tuesday, I was just returning from uh, Coffs Harbour from a, from a wedding. And I got into the motel early in the early hours of the morning and I... For some reason, I just flicked through Facebook and I saw the, the pictures there that had been posted. And I guess intuitively, when you see pictures like that on a feed, you know what has, has happened. And it was the words that were then attached to it that we've seen in our, our program today, when a great tree falls. So typify the man that Des was. A giant that that impacted his world in just so many different ways, impacted family, impacted the church, impacted the globe for the kingdom. And as I read through those words, sadness struck my heart because indeed a great man, a soldier of the faith, had indeed fallen. But as I was preparing the words for today, my my mind was brought to Psalms chapter 1. Had Dead written anything? Had he said anything in this particular scripture that, that would be meaningful for us today, meaningful for the people around the globe that were watching, that would be a testament to who he was? And thank you, Declan, for, for sharing these words this morning. 
He is like a tree, verse 3 says, planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. As I read through this, this psalm, I thought, what an apt description of this man. But it's what he wrote next to it that, that also stirred my heart. And it's these, I guess, in particular that I want to share this morning of, of his own words, of what he written beside there, as, as a, in a sense, that beacon of light for us to live by. Now, for, for many of us, we're older, and, and these words will be meaningful. But it's also to the younger generation, the, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren, I think in particular these words are, are relevant. Because he highlighted these, these three words, and I just want to briefly share this morning. Planted, purpose, and prosperous. Three words that he, he used to summarise Psalms chapter 1. Planted, purpose, and prosperous. I want to say Des's feet's feet, or feet's big feet. Des's feet were planted in the gospel. It was just not a, a theoretical understanding of the gospel and, and what it was. His feet and his mind, his heart, truly understood what the gospel was. He was one who lived out his, his faith. In fact, as he, um, his latest book, Back to Basics, hopefully you all bought a copy to share it around, in it he, he captures the essence of the gospel. This is a, a book that um, Neil Watts, Pastor Neil Watts, through um, the support of generous donors, has been given out to the island fields to our, our volunteers in action as, as a textbook for them because it summarises the teaching of Scripture and for, for people that haven't had a, a formal education, this book gave great oversight to them and so the, the Gospel is portrayed in here and, and I was looking through a section that captured the essence of Jesus, of who He is from the book of Revelation. He says... Um, Jesus is shown in, as the very centre of the book of Revelation. Every chapter contains its own revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is one thing in his ministry he was, he was keen to convey, keen to, to show to others that Jesus was the centre, not only of his life, but also he wanted that to be the centre of other people's lives as well. He goes through and says that he is the all-sufficient saviour in chapter 1 and ministering priest. Chapter 2 is the wonderful and sympathetic reprover of churches, is the creator who shares the throne with men as a slain lamb, the foundation of the world, the centre of adoration. He's the leader of the church and goes forth conquering and to conquer. He's shown as the lamb among a blood-washed multitude. As I jump down to chapter 14, he says, you know, he's, he's the lamb from Mount Zion, sending his last message to the world. He's a lamb receiving praise, but whose judgment destroys apostate kingdoms. Chapter 21, he's pictured as the recreator who wipes away tears. In 22, as the judge who brings final rewards and sends the last invitation to a doomed world. The gospel mattered to death. As I look through other parts of his Bible, of where the gospel was illustrated, he came across to um, Isaiah 53, this picturing of a, of a suffering servant. And on this particular section, he made a, several comments. He said, you know, this was given 700 years in advance. It's a central chapter of the last 27, as if he's, he's wanting to peel back the curtains of the message of Isaiah and say, here it is. This is the, the suffering servant that, that mattered. This is the person that would change the course 
of the world. And then as he said that this was a central chapter, he then goes one step further and illustrates and underlines verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Healed. Des loved the gospel. We all like sheep have gone astray, he goes on to underline. Each of us have turned to his own way and the Lord has placed on him the iniquity of us all. But as I went through further the book of Isaiah, he highlighted chapter 66, verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me. Des was looking forward to another day as well and highlighted that as something that was important to him. Des's life, his ministry was planted in the gospel. Secondly, his word purposeful. Des's life was full of purpose. We've heard that this morning in what has been shared. And, and you know this yourselves with, with your engagements with, and I affectionately know him as, as DBH. He'd send you a letter and he'd sign off with those initials, DBH. Des' life was full of purpose. From his calling in ministry, he moved forward in mission, not just with himself, but with a family. And, and narrowly you've indicated that you, know, you were on mission with him, the whole family, in, in travelling, in being involved with, with what, was, what he was doing. In fact, as we sat with Val on well, earlier this week, and she showed me the, the different manuals that he had written, that he, he'd authored in, in Africa to help the work move forward in, in Africa. His life was, was full of purpose. As I went through different scriptures, and I guess I was starting to now look for themes, look for, to narrow down what was the driving force behind some of the things that, that Des was doing. And, and so I went to uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 9. And sure enough, there it was, underlined. The drive for the gospel... And Matthew 9 says, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news to the kingdom of, of heaven and, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Dev, Des was, was driven, not only by this himself, he knew the workers were, were few. He wanted to be one, he'd committed to be one, but he also wanted to find others to join in this mission to take the gospel to the world that would impact the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on, he's, he's underlined in, in, in Matthew chapter 10 as well, he called the twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Then the twelve, Jesus sent out the following instructions. Do not go among the, the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach the message. And, and no matter where Des went, he was preaching that message. And more so, he was living that message. Preach that the kingdom of heaven is near. In a sense, as I, you recount sermons and stories, that was his message in his sermons. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, Matthew goes on to say, raise the dead, Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. In, in, in actual fact, make the gospel, let it have impact 
on the world in which you live. And indeed, he did that. And then as I turn through to, to Matthew 28, the Gospel Commission, sure enough, there it was, underlined. All authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. And that was his mission. If I turn then through to, to Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, again, highlighted. This was where the power for his ministry came. The Holy Spirit empowered him, causing him to be a witness to all nations. And as I kept turning into the, the last chapter of, of, or last book of the Bible, again, the very core of the Advent message was here underlined. And then I saw another angel flying in midair. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth. And so it didn't matter whether that gospel was being proclaimed in, in a little town in New Zealand or Avondale College or across Union Territories or the Division. He was to preach and teach that message. He was purposeful in ministry with the everlasting gospel. And finally, Des's life was, was prosperous. Prosperous in, in so many different ways, whether it was with, with family, whether it's with the preaching of the gospel. In fact, I went back into the, uh, some of the pages online of the Adventist record. And there's a story there of, of Des leading a, a campaign with several pastors in New Zealand. And, and bringing a harvest of, of 524 people baptised during that, that program, during that series of, of programs. Des's life was, was prosperous for the kingdom. But I also want to say it wasn't just the kingdom he was prosperous for as well. Because as, as has been shared, he found young men, identified young men, and tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey... You better go to Avondale. The Lord's calling you to ministry. And it doesn't matter. I, I, I wouldn't have a, a figure on, on, on how many young men that, that Des has mentored. But I can think of one. As he would greet on different occasions, whether it was here at, at Memorial or, or whether it's around at his home, in that distinct voice that DBH had, how are you, young fella? And you knew that, that he was genuinely interested in connecting and understanding and, and pushing you forward for the kingdom. Glenn, you mentioned the, he commented on you. And there would be countless others that he's also done the, sum, the same for as well, of those young lives that he's pushed forward for the kingdom. So prosperity just simply isn't in numbers of baptisms, but it's in those that he's mentored, those that he's encouraged into ministry. As I reflected on, on this, there is one passage that he also underlined, and I think he, he lived this out himself, but he also encouraged others to live this out. As Ephesians 4 says, Paul speaking, as a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live. He's underlined the word live. He's written above it, walk. To live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And so for, for us here, it's that call for faithfulness in what God has, has given to us. And this was important to this. It's important to, as, 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 as I read from his Bible today, that we continue on that to live a life worthy of the calling that the Most High has given to us. No matter our age, whether young or, or old, to be worthy in that calling that God has, has given to us. Verse 2 says, be completely humble. It's as like, you know, Des took this and was living it. You know, be completely humble and gentle and patient bearing with one another 
in love. These passages illustrate what was important to Desmond B. Hills. And so as we reflect back on Psalms 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that spring and bring forth fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. A psalm that describes a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend and a mentor. Planted, purposeful and prosperous. prosperous. This was his life. But his hope also laid in something far greater. His hope was found in, in the Advent message that he taught, he preached, he studied, he shared. This was the hope of a, in a sin-pardoning redeemer that would soon come again. I should have got a copy of, of Great Controversy. I'm sure this would have been underlined, Val. It is at midnight that God manifests his power. And this is where Des was looking forward to for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears shining in its strength, signs and wonders following quick succession. The wicked look on with terror and amazement upon the scenes, while the righteous behold with solemn joys the tokens of their deliverance. What a scene. What a hope. What a joy. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark and heavy clouds come up, clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens, one clear space of indescribable glory, whence comes the voice of God, the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. Pastor Hills' life, his eyes were fixed on another day. The Apostle Paul, commenting on this, again, something that was important to, to Pastor Hills, he says in verse 1, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received on the day when you have taken your stand. And it's interesting as I read through this particular section of, of his Bible, it wasn't just what was underlined, you know how when you've, you've owned a Bible a long time, the, the pages get turned up, they get dirty on the edges. The, the last section of this particular Bible, it seems that he spent a lot of time in this section, drawing encouragement, drawing, drawing hope in, this, in the writings of Paul. And it's this day that Des was looking forward to. Reading from verse 51... Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. This was the day Des was looking forward to. The sound of the trumpet, the call of, of God, as Lazarus called, was called forth from the tomb, Des will hear his name as well. Des, come forth, your father calleth thee. This was the day that his eyes were fixed on. For the, for the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then it is written that will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where O death is your victory, where O death is your sting. 
The sting of death is in sin, the power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me conclude with his own words of an article that was written back in 1970. Sorry, 1960s. At that point, he was writing a a column for Signs of the Times magazines. In fact, I remember, you know, August. What do you know we're August for? Signs Month. And, and, and Des would appear in churches all around the division because it was August, it was Signs Month. And in that, he, he was writing a, a section for teenagers, timely topics for teenagers who are looking for a certainty in today's uncertain world. He would answer questions whether God heals... Oh, this was a... Sorry, one he was answering about whether God heals people. And Des said yes. And he concluded his answer with this. We'll finish with these words. God does not always intervene and grant more life to those who are living good lives. This reason may never be known, but we trust God... Remember that he did not intervene to spare his own son's life. Had God saved Jesus from dying on the cruel cross of Calvary, we could not have saved, we could not have been saved for the kingdom of heaven. In all matters concerning life, death, sickness, and health, we need to exercise faith in God. Time and eternity will prove that all things work together for good to them that love God. Romans 8 28. We may not know our future or anyone else's future, but we know the one who holds the future. Maranatha. Let's bow our heads for the benediction on the life of a man of God, our eternal, loving Father in heaven. We've remembered today your blessings and your leading in the life of Desmond Hills, a wonderful preacher, leader, husband, father, grandfather, colleague, and friend to all. His unique optimism and his strong hope and faith in Jesus Christ stayed with him right through his whole life. We want to say thank you for the strong influence that Des had on everyone that he met. It can be truly said that the life of Desmond Hills was wrapped up in Jesus. The infinite love that was heaped on Des and the response of love that he returned was the hallmark of his life. Everything in the life of Des was because of Jesus. It was all through Jesus, and everything he did was for Jesus. As we've come to say goodbye to our friend today, we know that his name is written in your book of life. Please remember this name. We know that you probably have it highlighted as one who's lived only for you and will wait for your rewards. May the love that Jesus gives be the same love that that comforts each and every day, Nerily and Alan and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. We ask that you'll be as close to Valme as he was to her, and even closer. May the hope that burned right through the long life of Des be the hope that inspires us all to meet the Lord Jesus Christ soon as he comes with his reward with him. We want to see Jesus most of all and we want to see Des and our loved ones with him again. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day until he comes in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Maranatha. all of us that we're unable to provide a wake today because of those restrictions but we would like to say and I know I'm speaking on behalf of Val and Nerily and the family to thank you ever so much for being here today to support the family. May God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs> 